Hi class, welcome to lecture two, part B. In uh, lecture two, part A, we discussed what states are, what makes the states sovereign and how they control their territory. In part B, which will be the final part of lecture two, we're gonna discuss three different types of classifications of states. And those are strong states, weak states, and failed states. And let's go over those in more detail. Now, a strong state we would define as a state that is able to fulfill basic tasks, um, perhaps most importantly, defend their territory, um, creating law and order, that is creating laws and enforcing them, uh, managing the economy, taking care of their citizens, protecting natural rights, et cetera. And you could, those definitions may differ what we consider um, basic tasks, but the ability to do the simple things. Um, with little to no non-compliance from domestic populations. Oh, excuse me, I went too far. Um, so an example of a strong state would be the United States, Canada, Britain, states that are able to do these basic essential functions for their citizens. Next, of course, we have weak states. These are states that cannot execute the task we just discussed, largely do to corruption. Uh, these are states where tax evasion exists, um, where there's a large amount of non-compliance from the citizens. Perhaps there's a large amount of organized crime. Maybe there's parts of the territory controlled by rebels trying to take over the country. Basically, they lack authority and they lack legitimacy. Okay. Now, for a long time, Russia would fall under this category right after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, when a sort of um, oligarchy was established and organized crime ran rampant. Now, I would say it um, has grown in some ways. In other ways, it's become more authoritarian. I mean, Putin, uh, for many of his faults, and has centralized authority and at least made... Um, you know, made a peace with, the mo with organized crimes, with the oligarchs, but there is still a lot of corruption. So perhaps Russia might fall under this category, but that's debatable. And lastly, we have failed states. And this is when the structure of a state becomes so weak, they just completely break down. The government isn't able to essentially govern or fulfill the most basic of tasks or services. Uh, the best examples of this um, are Somalia, of course, um, you know, a lot of danger in Somalia, a lot of corruption, not a strong governmental presence. And again, Afghanistan, this keeps coming up because of what's going on in the news right now. Um, Afghanistan literally yesterday um, has fallen to the Taliban. Okay, so the government there is not able to provide basic goods and services. And it'll be interesting to see how it goes from here after a 20 year war. Now, we're gonna do a short case study here. Um, normally for case studies, it'll be the entire lecture. This is going to be kind of introductory case study. We're going to talk very briefly about Pakistan. And we're going to use this as an example of a failed or maybe failing state. We'll try to determine that, okay? It does have many of the characteristics of a failing state, a lack of government infrastructure, a lack of basic, lack of basic necessities provided by the government. For example, as I say here, uh, poor electric grids, terrible health care, poor education, its judicial system is unresponsive, uh, widespread poverty and corruption. Now, just some quick facts about Pakistan in case you're um, curious. Their type of government is a parliamentary republic or a federal republic. Um, their current president is Arif Falbi, their current prime minister Imran Khan, and their capital is Islamabad. Just a, some trading card stats there for Pakistan. Now, Pakistan has problems with terrorism. We know this. They have the fourth largest number of terrorist deaths uh, per year in the world, quite a bit. Um, large portions of their territory, particularly along the Afghan border, are not controlled by the states. There's villages there that are outside of state control. And a lot of these areas, terrorism does run rampant and they're very hard to govern. Now, the most disturbing aspect perhaps of Pakistan is the lack of governmental control over their military. So you could even argue that the military in Pakistan is stronger than the government. It, it's a rogue military. 
they they operate autonomously from the government they're not really taking orders from the government now considering that pakistan is one of the nine countries one of the nine states that has nuclear weapons this is extremely troubling also considering that they separated from india we'll talk about this in a second but they separated from india india also has nuclear weapons and they're constantly going back and forth on the brink of war the likelihood of nuclear war perhaps is greatest among india and pakistan than any other country so very disturbing that the government lacks control over their military uh, the military itself is very fragmented you have f factions in the military vying for power um, and the weak central government is not able to assert its dominance or control over that military and those factions. So let's get into the why. Why is Pakistan a failing or failed state? Again, it usually comes down to corruption when political leaders are searching for personal gain or personal, whether it be power or financial gain and not working for the interest of the citizens. And you might say, okay, well, maybe that politicians do that here too. And I think to an extent that's true, but we have a system of checks and balances to hopefully stop that before it gets too bad. Pakistan doesn't have that political infrastructure to stop corruption, to stop these people from robbing the country blind. Um, you know, there is evidence also going back to the military that some factions of their military against very splintered have supported terror groups, including the Taliban. And, you know, if you remember from when the United States uh, SEAL Team 6 took down Osama bin Laden, he was hiding um, in a compound in Pakistan, not far from one of Pakistan's military schools. So it's perhaps likely they knew he was there. So there, it seems like they do have ties to terror groups in Pakistan's. And again, to me, and I would say to many people, the most troubling aspect is Pakistan's nuclear weapons are under a, a military control that is not controlled by their government and is severely fractioned. So let's talk a little bit about the history of Pakistan. And Pakistan's really an interesting case because we can compare it to India. And this is what comparative politics is all about because we have two countries that essentially started at the same time with vastly different results. So. In 1947, India gains independence from Britain, right, after being colonized for a long time. So as India is getting their own state, Muslim leaders in India also demanded that they get an independent state called Pakistan, which they achieved. And we get this contrast, though, in the success of the two countries, okay? Now, this is particularly startling because they faced many of these same challenges. Um, both states faced poverty, uh, weak infrastructure, weak government, um, you know, weak institutions, disputes, turmoil left over from the colonization from Britain. And if anything, uh, Pakistan probably had an advantage over India because they're united with a common religious identity, um, Islam, whereas India is more fractured between um, Islam um in christianity and other religions now as soon as pakistan um, forms it immediately goes into a territorial war with india and again they're constantly vying for territory there's some disputed areas like the hindu kush mountain range that are kind of always a hotbed of activity between india and pakistan they're almost always on the brink of war um, so because their focus was on defending themselves and competing against India, who they, they saw and still see as a great threat, a large emphasis was put on their military. And what ended up happening was the military got perhaps too strong for a government that wasn't very strong and eventually became stronger than the government itself, which is what gives us a situation that we see today. So the initial party that took control of Pakistan was the Muslim League. Um, their main goals, how they started, was rhetoric for independence from India. So when they achieved this goal, that was essentially all they had on the docket. They, they had centered their whole campaign, really, around one cause, 
and didn't really have plans to build up the country. So it lacked the strong leadership and values that a nation needs to succeed, especially when they're just forming, right? Like if you think about the United States when they're just forming, they had a very clear idea from the founding fathers and from philosophers like Hobbes and Locke and Montesquieu of how they wanted to build their country. Pakistan certainly lacked these goals and these ambitions, or at least lacked attention towards these things because of their conflict with India. So in a lot of ways we can perhaps, you know, go back to colonization. Um, colonization is very tough. To recover from colonization is very difficult. We see this all over Africa. Um, we see it in this region. We see it in Asia. You know, we saw it with India. We saw it with Pakistan. It does a number on you because when a country colonizes another, and we'll talk about dependency theory later in the semester, but all your infrastructure is based on a foreign entity. All um, your systems run through this foreign entity and they leave, they're kind of leaving you in the lurch to kind of create your own system, which is very difficult to do because of a lack of internal leadership. Okay, oh, so to sum it up, um, again, it, it's, it's a good comparison here because we have Pakistan and India, both separating, both creating states around the same time after colonization from Britain. One state, India, while it has its problems and it had a long history of poverty and corruption, is trending upwards economically. And Pakistan remains in the territory of a failed or failing state, okay? So it's worth looking at these attributes um, and trying to figure out why one is becoming successful and why one isn't. And we've talked about a few options. Maybe it's because of colonization. Maybe it's because they had to separate from India and India just separated from Britain. Maybe it's cultural issues, maybe it's uh, religious identity, right? There's a whole myriad of things that have led to Pakistan's failure. And that's something we have to realize, guys, there's never gonna be a clean answer. There's hardly ever gonna be one thing that causes the failure of a state. And this is a perfect example of that. So I just have some questions here for you to think about before our next lecture. We've seen different types of state systems exist, right? We talked about them in our first lecture. We talked about um, the Greek city-state system. We talked about the medieval era with loosely defined borders, then the creation of with the Peace of Westphalia into the modern day na nation state system. And that's lasted for you know, 500, 400, 500 years, right? Do you guys think that this will last another 500 years, another thousand years? Or will we eventually have a system it, that is totally different than it looks like right now? Definitely worth thinking about. Um, and if that's the case, what other systems might rise up? Will we have giant nation states? Like, will all of North America be one state? Will corporations like Amazon control territory with their own private military forces? Certainly a possibility, right? And finally, interesting question, is the United States still a unipolar power? Is the United States still the world's sole superpower or are we getting challenged? That question, you don't have to answer now, you don't have to think about yet. But I want you to keep that in mind as we go further into the semester. So that does it for lecture two, guys. I will see you soon for lecture three.